Welcome back to this Thursday's Sutta study here at Peace House. And this evening we will talk about uh, the Ambalatika Rahulovada Sutta, that is middle length discourses number 61. So Amba means mangoes, Attika uh, or Lattika means a stone. So Rahula is the son of the Buddha. Ovada means giving advices, instructions. So oh, the, the sutta has the name as the dis exhortation to Rahula at Mango Stone. So before I begin, I will talk a little bit about Rahula. Rahula um, is the son of the Buddha and um, son of the Prince Siddhartha before he became the Buddha. And he is said to have been born on the day of the great renunciation of Siddhartha. So Siddhartha heard the news that a son was born to him and then went to see him. And uh, he felt something in his heart. And he said, now I am bonded. Um, and it's hard for me to escape the household life. So um, he said it in in his language, and I have heard, I've learned it something like Rahulo Jato Bandanang Jatam. So Rahulo Rahula is the name given to him, and Rahula means a bondage, something that hinders his path. Especially when you have a son, it is a huge responsibility for a father. And in this case, Rahula um, is the successor for his throne because Siddhartha was a king. And um, Siddhartha's son, uh, Siddhartha's father, that is Rahula's grandfather, was King Suddhodana. And grandmother <clears throat> was uh, Mahamaya. Um, and Mahapajapati was the aunt. Um, so Mahamaya died within seven days of giving birth to Siddhartha. So Mahapajapati looked after Siddhartha and to her grandson Rahula, they all may have been there, his. Um, you know, they may have all looked after Rahula. And uh, Yashodara was Rahula's mother. And uh, for as soon as the son was born, he decided that had he stayed longer, he will be bonding and he will not fulfill his greater goal of becoming enlightened, learning the truths and uncovering you know, what is the greatest mystery that he had about birth, enlightenment, getting sick, and uh, death. He wanted to find answers as to why this keeps happening, and particularly because maybe his father prevented him from seeing elderly people, seeing dead, dead bodies, or particularly sick, sick people, and, and maybe he grew... Um, extremely curious about these natural phenomena and he thought he could, you know, he, 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 his intention was to find an answer uh, to these mysteries and as soon as he saw a monk and because of the kind of education he has had, I think he thought the way out must be meeting these wise people and asking uh, them about the questions he had and they may have um, <clears throat> told him to meditate and find answers to his questions so he renounced and he for six months he was a truth seeker this was 
Siddhartha, Rahula's father, and Siddhartha didn't know any of these things. Sorry, Rahula didn't know any of these things. And later when uh, Suddhodana, Siddhartha's father, um, invited the Buddha, who was his son, to visit their kingdom, um, Siddhartha did not immediately accept this invitation. It took many messengers, many royal ministers visiting the Buddha, but they all received ordination. So they failed at bringing him to the kingdom. Only this last minister, uh, Kaludai, praised the, the natural beauty on the way to the, the, the road, bringing them to Kapilavastu. Uh, Buddha accepted the invitation. Um, and so he visited Kapilavastu, the kingdom of his father, and uh, his son, who was now between seven to ten years old, um, knowing that he is a successor for the kingdom, uh, and Yasodhara telling him to ask for his inheritance. So Prince Rahula went to his father and held his finger and asked, you know, and just as they were walking, asked, um, give me my inheritance. And in this, you know, what is my, where is my inheritance? Joke, maybe he was just kidding. He didn't know the gravity of what he was saying. And the Buddha can only give wisdom as its inheritance to his son. So the Buddha did not stop the son from walking with him to the monastery. The son, of course, felt comfortable and also was fascinated by seeing his dad and followed the Buddha to the monastery. And um, so because he kept repeatedly asking for inheritance, you know, monks may have suggested that, okay, let's give him inheritance by ordaining him. So the decision to ordain him came and everybody adorned the newly ordained uh, prince. But this upset the mother and the father of, especially Yasodhara and the grand granddad. He said, you know, I'm heartbroken. You know, you did not, you, you first you became an ascetic and now you, now you have taken my only hope, that is my grandson. Never do that again without the permission of parents. And the Buddha said, may it be so that we, I will never ordain anyone um, without the um, permission of parents. And the, the thing is, when someone is ordained, it is a lifetime choice, uh, at least in some traditions. So, um, so they, maybe they saw no hope of bringing him back now that the whole society knows that he, he became a monk. And, um, and this means the kingdom collapses, that there is no continuation after this. Although there were other um, people that could be named as the crown prince, or, but it, it just became so weak and everybody started coming to the monastery and being fascinated by the teachings of the Buddha and being receiving ordination. And this led to the collapsing of the kingdom eventually. Maybe there were rulers trying to keep it going, but the interest changed um, in their minds to be ordained and, and practice the spiritual path and become an heir of the spiritual kingdom. And there's, so there's Rahula now ordained and he, he had this habit of um, throwing a bunch of sand out into the air and saying, may I receive this much advice from my elders today? So he, he became foremost among those who seek training and advice. So the title he was given by the Buddha is that he's Sikha 
Kamanang Aggo. That means he is the foremost among those who like to learn. So there were many who liked to learn, but he was the foremost among them. And uh, apparently his ordination was the first novice ordination held by a quorum of monks. Prior to that, usually one has to be 20 years of age to receive ordination. And that means they receive the full monk status, Upasampada ordination immediately. But at this um, Rahula's case, he was very young and he, he was not 20 years of age. So they gave him novice ordination until he became matured enough to receive full ordination and understand what rules and responsibilities he had. So he apparently became a stream winner. That is the first stage of enlightenment um, at the age of seven, that, you know, as young as seven. That is um, a title, you know, that's not a title, that's a realization one gets by learning that there's learning, learning the hollow nature of believing in the self, letting go of rites and rituals, and uh, what is it? Uh, doubt, he, doubting the path. So he, he abandoned these three fetters, the view of a self, he abandoned that, he abandoned doubting the path, and he abandoned rites and rituals. So the moment one realizes the needlessness of these fet, you know, these these things that can stop one from realizing the truth, they become they get on the path of becoming enlightened. And so entering the path alone is not enough. Uh, path and fruition are two different things. First, you enter the path and then you reach the fruition. So these are called Magga and Pala, path and fruition in the, in the path of Buddhism. There are more levels one can achieve, simply abandoning sensual desire and aversion um, that, that qualifies you to get to the next level. Uh, lesser degree of aversion and lesser degree of sensual desire uh, qualifies you to enter the path and complete abandoning of sensual desire and anger. These are called Kamaraga and Patiga, the fetters that are very strong. It's hard to abandon sensual desire and it's hard to abandon anger <laughs> for all the people. But abandoning these you know, makes you a very pure person and it's, of course, understandable how that can happen. And they then they are very this close to becoming completely enlightened. And by removing any, any fetter, any bonding to ignorance, anything that, is, um, that, that keeps them from seeing the truth, by abandoning that, they become enlightened completely. Uh, become those people who have true knowledge of the 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 everything. When I say everything, I mean uh, all the um, questions about birth, death, um, getting getting sick, and uh, what many lies that we believe, and abandoning these lies and conclusions that may be wrong about life. Many deceptions, illusions that we abandon and arrive at true knowledge. So in the case of Rahula, he entered the path and uh, he, was, he was very keen on practicing and learning and uh, he was very obedient. And, uh, and when he was 18, he was infatuated by the idea that his dad Siddhartha Gautama and himself were very handsome. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is not a good thought he entertained. And Buddha, upon seeing um, 
his mind or after learning that he had this thought discouraged him and educated him on the matter uh, in general and how empty matter is of a permanent being. And upon learning the truth about these realizations, um, he abandoned these ideas from his mind. I'm sure because he was the son of the Buddha, he started getting attention, but the Buddha did not treat him any special. The Buddha treated him just as he treated other novice monks. So the rule, uh, there was a rule established by the Buddha that a novice monk cannot sleep in the same room as a fully ordained monk. And when this rule came about, um, Rahula slept in a toilet built for monks. Um, I'm sure it was not dirty, but he was so humble that he just did not question it and he did not want to break the rule. He just, uh, you know, slept uh, in a, in a maybe it was a large toilet built for monks, and that he found it um, good to sleep. And upon learning this, the Buddha changed the rule, allowing them to uh, sleep in a comfortable place. So these rules came and um, strengthened the monastic uh, dispensation. Uh, and usually these were established for the convenience of monks who were very keen on upkeeping the tradition and uh, reaching enlightenment. So um, at this one time, the Buddha visited Rahula and gave a teaching on uh, falsehood. So we are going to learn that today. <clears throat> So let me increase the font. This is uh, Middle Length Discourses number 61. So let's read a little bit of it. I have heard that one occasion the Blessed One was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo forest, the squirrel sanctuary. At that time, Venerable Rahula was staying at the mango stone. Then the Blessed One, emerging from his seclusion in the evening, went to where Venerable Rahula was staying at the mango stone. Venerable Rahula saw him coming from afar, and on seeing him, set out a seat and water for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat set out, and having sat down, washed his feet, Venerable Rahula, bowing down to the Blessed One, sat to one side. So Buddha himself washed his own feet. So take a note, mental note, uh, note on that. Then the Blessed One, having left a little bit of the remaining water in the water dipper, said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this little bit of remaining water left in the water dipper? Yes, sir. That is how little of a contemplative there is in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie. <laughs> so that means there's only little left in you if you tell a lie and you are a monk. <laughs> there's very little monkness there is, like this little bit of water in that pot. <laughs> so very strong advice here. And then the Buddha takes it further. Having tossed away the little bit of remaining water, the Blessed One said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see how this little bit of remaining water is tossed away? Yes, sir. Rahula, whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is tossed away just like that. So whatever is left in him is now gone. <laughs> He had only that much, and it's also gone. He's not a monk anymore. He's so empty. <laughs> Having turned the water dipper upside down, <laughs> the Buddha said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see how this water dipper is turned upside down? Yes, sir. Rahula, 
whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is turned upside down, just like that. <laughs> so now the, the pot is turned upside down and uh, there's nothing left in him that's completely empty inside. Having turned the water dipper right side up, now you can see the emptiness clearly. <laughs> the Blessed One said to Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see how empty and hollow, empty and hollow this water dipper is? Yes, sir. <laughs> Rahula, whatever there is of a contemplative in anyone who feels no shame at telling a deliberate lie is empty and hollow, just like that. So, uh, Contemplative here is samanya. Samanya is any recluseness of a person that um, one claims to have and still tells a deliberate lie. He is empty, the Buddha says. Bless you. And then the Buddha takes another metaphor. Rahula, it is like a royal elephant. Immense, pedigreed, accustomed to battles, it starts like chariot falls. Having gone into battle, it uses its four, four feet and hind feet, its four quarters and hind quarters, its head and ears and tusks and tail, but will simply hold back its trunk. The elephant trainer notices that and thinks, this royal elephant has not given up its life to the king. But when the royal elephant, having gone into battle, uh, uses um, its four feet and hind feet, its four quarters, hind quarters, its head and ears and tusks and tail and his trunk, the trainer notices that and thinks, this royal elephant has given up its life to the king. There is nothing it will not do. <laughs> and now you see what the Buddha says. In the same way, Rahula, when anyone feels no shame in telling a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I tell you, he will not do. <laughs> you think, you know, he's trying to say something positive about the elephant. That's not the case. <laughs> That's saying that when you have not, when you are not protecting your nose, basically, <laughs> you are you know, going for destruction. <laughs> Thus, Rahula, you should train yourself. I will not tell a deliberate lie, even in jest. Even not for fun, don't tell a lie. <laughs> this is when maybe Rahula and other monks, you know, Rahula had enough time to build friendships. There were many royals who were ordained and uh, that maybe they can indulge in conversations when the Buddha was not around, when their teacher was not around, and they can tend to talk about kings, how big the cities are, and what they saw, and all this stuff. But then this stops it. <laughs> Someone can get so creative about telling something and that they, they don't even know that they are telling a lie. So now the third parable, that is of a mirror, comes. What do you think, Rahula? What is a mirror for? And Rahula says, for reflection, Venerable In the same way, Rahula, bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental actions are to be done with repeated reflection. Whenever you want to do a bodily action, you should reflect on it. This bodily action I want to do, would it lead to self-affliction? to the affliction of others, or to both? Would it be an unskillful bodily action with painful consequences, painful results? If on reflection you know that it would lead to self-affliction, to the affliction of others, or to both, it would be an unskillful bodily action with painful consequences, painful results, then any bodily action of that sort is absolutely unfit for you to do. But if on reflection you know 
that it would not cause affliction. It would be a skillful bodily action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. Then any bodily action of that sort is fit for you to do. <clears throat> so while you are doing a bodily action, you should reflect on it. This bodily action I'm doing, is it leading to self-affliction, to the affliction of others or to both? Is it an unskillful bodily action with painful consequences, painful results? If on reflection you know that it is leading to self-affliction, to affliction of others or both, you should give it up. But if on reflection you know that it is not, you may continue with it. Having done a bodily action, so, so this is actually before doing it, while doing it and after doing it, you reflect on it. So then, then it comes to verbal actions and, uh, and then mental actions. So, so the three ways to investigate bodily actions, verbal actions and mental actions. So it's interesting here that mental action is also is there as part of the instructions because you know, someone may, can say that uh, something like, may you be well in hell. That's not a nice thing to say, right? That is mental action. And you can see immediately how your brain may not know the difference and your brain may wire to think in a, in a way that is harmful to yourself and that we make it a habit to say such things. You know, if we intend it, that if we intend any harm upon somebody else, that that is harmful to others. So in in a way, uh, whether it is mental action, bodily action, or verbal action, so it's it's a very nice way to reflect on our the consequences and beneficial nature of things. So toward the end. So if it is, it was a skillful mental action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results, then you should stay mentally refreshed and joyful, training day and night in skillful qualities. You see, it is immediately beneficial. It is like, may you be really deeply well. And you can forgive people, you can forget their mistakes, and you start to feel joyful day and night because you are free from holding any grudge. Rahula, all those contemplatives and Brahmins in the course of the past who purified their bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental actions did it through repeated reflection on their bodily actions, verbal actions, and mental actions in just this way. So he's, the Buddha is saying about other monks who are already enlightened, they did their examining before doing these bodily, mental, and verbal actions, and they purified their con conduct accordingly. Thus, Rahula, you should train yourself. I will purify my bodily actions through repeated reflection. I will purify my verbal actions through repeated, repeated reflection. I will purify my mental actions through repeated reflection. That is how you should train yourself. That is what the Blessed One said, gratified, when the Rahula delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that is the teaching for today. Could you please get the door? Maybe someone thinks that... Uh, it's at six o'clock. Yeah, it's at six o'clock. Um, Unfortunately, your mic is still not working, but we will do some meditation anyway, and we can catch up next week or next time we, we meet. We will wait for that person who rang the doorbell. 
for this reason, we are thinking of um, having 6 p.m. as the time of the program. Although we have a Zen group meeting at 7, uh, we are planning on asking them if they can come at 7.30 instead of 7 so that we have enough time to wrap up. Thank you, Lee, for letting her in. Hello. <laughs> Please grab a seat. <laughs> oh, couch. Uh -huh. One of the legs is broken. You can sit in the chair if you like. Oh, sure. Let's wait for Lee to join us. How are you? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. I went to my phone. I'll have to figure this out. Wonderful. On Thursday, yeah, on Thursday is this right at 5.30, oh, okay. but we are thinking of changing the time to 6. Oh, okay. The only issue, only problem is that we have a um, Wake Up Boston, Boston group coming at 7. So if they can come at 7.30, yeah. maybe yeah. we have enough time to wrap up. Yeah. So Kusala? Oh. Yeah. Now that I can talk, apparently. I will <laughs> not be here next week. Okay. The first, but I will be here the following week. Okay. And I will assume it's at six o'clock. Um, I will let you know uh, okay. actually no if the if the time changes. Um Okay, no problem. Yeah. And in the meantime, it'll give me some time to figure out what the very expensive iPad has a problem with that it didn't have this morning. I I'm sorry, I didn't Oh, yeah. I said I said it will give me some time to figure out what the what's wrong with the expensive iPad that wasn't wrong oh. this morning. Yeah, <laughs> what, um, I'm I sure said. it's working fine, and you can. Uh, I I'll work on it during the week, but I all of a sudden yeah. you know have limited skills. All of a sudden it was like, oh, what about the phone? <laughs> right. Okay, thank you for indulging me and whoever else is with you. No, uh, you're welcome. Let's let's do some meditation. Maybe Lee can join us slightly later. Okay. I'm hearing the gong, but I know Zoom people cannot hear it. Oh. <laughs> Is this? Oh. So please close your eyes and come to a meditation posture.
and maybe you can take a deep breath in and focus on your inhaling and exhaling for now. Drop the weight of the past, weight of the future, your shoulders at ease. No burden being carried by you at this moment. And you can quickly scan your body. And move away from any agitations. And come back to your breath. As, as you let go of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, physical th sensations and thinking, you begin to feel calm and relaxed. A sense of Judgment lead from unwholesome to wholesome. A judgment to arrive at non-judgmental awareness. Attention to non-attention to things. Attention to not knowing what comes next. No need of a reaction to everything that is happening. Just simply see things arising and passing away from your attention. So mindfully you breathe in, mindfully you breathe out. Taking a long breath, you know you are taking a long breath. Taking a short breath, you know you are taking a short breath. Whether you are inhaling or exhaling, simply notice the point of touch of your breath, your lungs filling, any euphoric sensation of joy arising because of your seclusion, seclusion from senses and unwholesome states.
As you meditate, notice your shoulders, your abdomen, upper and lower back. You may come to a meditation posture again and again, a way to feel the tranquility and wisdom within you, calmness within you. Any time during this meditation, feel free to <clears throat> adjust your posture to support your sitting. Allow the blood flow to circulate. And that way we are being kind and gentle with our bodies. Now notice the entire breath body from starting to the end, how it gets involved with the body and how it is a bodily function. Without you thinking, your body breathes in and breathes out. Making space for that calmness that you start to feel in your body. See if your breath or parts of your body vanish from your attention. It becomes so subtle that your body breathes in, breathes out and your mind may not notice it because it's so subtle, but you still stay applying mindfulness to the feeling that you are breathing in and breathing out. Everything becomes so quiet, you can stay in tuned with the rhythm that you feel. No rushing to go anywhere or arrive at anything.
There is meditation, no meditator, no controller. The path is there is no traveler. All things arise and pass away without a person having to do anything with them. Unplugged. Just letting things come and go. Making simple effort to stay with your breath. Only when you feel distracted from it. Notice also how our mind runs to the future, to a planning state, constructing things. And then you apply mindfulness to it and come back to your relaxing with each and every breath you are taking. You'll stay in silence for a couple of minutes before we end this meditation. And when you hear the gong, you can come out of your meditation and open your eyes then.
May the suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation and you all. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. It's also the new moon day tonight, so please enjoy seeing the moon in the sky if you do see the moon. Yeah. Full moon, day, not new moon. Is it not? It's, it's full moon day. Yeah, it's not full moon. Yeah, so oh, wow. so new moon is different from it. Yeah, full moon day. But yeah, both both full moon and new moon are considered uh, the Upasata day. Yeah, we did that today. The observance. Of, yeah. Six, like the holy days. 